Hello to everyone in the Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Cathedral community and all of our friends. This is Father Jonathan. I hope you're doing well. Today we're going to continue our series on the lives of the saints. And on this, the 12th of March, we celebrate the memory of our venerable and God-bearing father, Simeon, the new theologian. Among the innumerable stars that shine in the spiritual firmament of the church, only three have been judged worthy of the title of theologian, St. John the Evangelist, the beloved disciple, who, leaning on the Lord's breath, drew thence the living water of the knowledge of the Word of God. St. Gregory of Nazianzus, who, having contemplated with a perfect, purified inner eye the mystery of the Holy Trinity, proclaimed it, placing at its service the best of Hellenic eloquence. And lastly, St. Simeon, the new theologian, who, after having been plunged in the light of the Holy Spirit, was sent by God as a new prophet into the, a very secure Byzantine society in which Christianity had become formal and official to witness to it that every Christian worthy of the name is called to be illumined and to become a son of God in the Holy Spirit. Born in 949 in Galatea, in Paphlagonia, which is in Asia Minor, Within a family of assured nobility and political influence, St. Simeon was sent at the age of 12 to Constantinople to continue his studies there, with the intention of entering the emperor's service. Turning his back on this promising career, he spent some time living a frivolous life. The Lord, though having pity on him, did not leave him to slide into, incorrup into corruption, but dragged him away from this precipice through the medium of spiritual reading. The youth then set himself to find a holy man capable of guiding him in the way of salvation. In spite of the discouraging words of those around him, who assured him that there was no such saint living at that time, persevering, however, in his quest he found his spiritual father in the person of a monk who was living in seclusion in the monastery of the Studion, namely St. Simeon the Pious. This Simeon refused to receive him as a monk, contenting himself with giving him the works of St. Mark the Ascetic to read. As soon as he opened the book, his eyes lit on the following passage. If you are looking for healing, look to your own conscience and do all that it tells you to do, and that will be gained to you. Receiving these words as divine oracle, he set to work immediately and followed his conscience that exhorted him to sacrifice himself for the love of Christ, increasing his fasts and vigil until cockcrow each day. Carried thus on the wings of holy desire, it was not long before he received his, the first testimony of God's favor in a wonderful vision of uncreated light that transported him as though he were outside the world and his own body. Filled with great joy and bathed in warm tears, he cried out incessantly, Kyrie eleison, and then at the heart of this light, he saw his spiritual father standing to the right of a luminous cloud and teaching him the art of undistracted prayer. However, as this first experience of God's glory was not based on the foundations of impassibility, he fell back a little by little into lukewarmness and laxity, of which he later repented before God as a great sin. For six or seven years he kept in touch with his spiritual father, but without tearing himself away from the world and its vanities. The Lord nevertheless had pity on his chosen vessel, and, taking him by the hair of his head, dragged him out of the mire of this world to place him before his face, making use of a mission to his native land. He had set his affairs in order, said farewell to his parents, and returned hastily to the capital to give himself over entirely to his father in God with a serene confidence and complete obedience. He was given as his cell a tiny nook under the staircase of Simeon's cell, where he fell to meditating on his sins in a holy compunction that he had learned in the world through visiting graves that had become a permanent state 
of soul for him. He carried out the most degrading service with a perfect renunciation of his own will regarding his spiritual father in Christ himself and devoutly kissing every place in which he prayed as though it were a hol the holy of holies. Thus protected by his prayer, he was able fearlessly to repulse the demon's assault of fear, sloth, impurity, and envy that set on him to discourage him, keeping himself a stranger to all and living in constant silence. He stood during the divine services with his head bent, shedding abundant tears as he listened to the sacred text. Some of the monks were irritated by this novice's rapid pro progress, that they looked on him as a condemnation of their own lukewarmness and accused him before the abbot of having too close a relationship with his spiritual father. Having asked the latter's prayers to strengthen him in this trial, he was assured by his spiritual father that he would very soon receive a grace from on high twice as great as his own. In fact, as soon as he got back to his cell that evening, a divine light came and took hold of his intellect, catching him up in the indescribable joy of divine love. And although his instruction was meager, God gave him from then on such wisdom that his companions were astounded. But such supernatural gifts elicited the hatred of the envious, and they succeeded in having him driven out of the studio. He then entered a little monastery of St. Mamas as a novice keep still keeping Simeon the pious as his spiritual father, tonsured monk at his hands and receiving the name Simeon, he rose up further and further on his spiritual path, consecrating himself completely to silence, prayer, and meditation on the Holy Scriptures, nourishing his body with a few herbs. His cell, which he left only to attend the divine services, was truly a burning fiery furnace in which he plunged with all his being to be transformed into a pure flame of love from which the Lord frequently drew him in sublime ecstasy. In one of his most beautiful discourses, Simeon compares himself with a wretch who, after having fallen into a mud-filled pit, was forcibly pulled out by the merciful Lord. Through many ambushes and difficulties, was led by the hand of his spiritual father to a water sources, there to be washed and purified, and from being blind to become a seer of spiritual things. To the degree to which he purified his inner sight, so he was granted visions of light that became clearer and clearer through a light that resembles a formless sun that he saw shining above the heavens and which removed from him the veil of insensibility, and he was able, little by little, to distinguish the face of Christ, and was finally taken out of the body in ineffable ecstasy, during which Christ spoke to him, calling him his brother and his friend. But it was only after great many other visions that, dissolving in tears one day, when venerating an icon of the Mother of God, he understood that he consciously prospered possessed in the depths of his heart this love and person that is the Lord himself. After two years, the abbot, ascertaining a progress in him that was worthy of admiration, had him ordained priest. On the day of his ordination, the Holy Spirit descended as a simple and formless light to cover the sacrifice, and for the rest of his priestly life, he never celebrated divine liturgy without having similar vision. Surrounded by a luminous cloud, his face took on an angelic expression, and no one could meet his eye as he blessed the people. The abbot, having died barely a year after his ordination, Simeon was elected superior by the monks of St. Mamas with the agreement of Patriarch Nicholas Chrysalberges. Inheriting a monastery that had been reduced to the service of a cemetery for lay folk, and in which the monastic rule was greatly relaxed, he undertook the reconstruction of all the buildings except the church, a task that was more difficult, the training of his disciples in following his ardent seeking of God. As the tradition of St. Theodore the Studite prescribed, he gave instructive talks to the monks three times a week with great ardor to rekindle the flame in them. He did not stop at simply reminding them of the principles of the sedimentic life, 
but as a poor man filled with fraternal love, who, having been a giving farthering, farthering, ran with joy to show it to his fellow wretches, urging them to hasten to take advantage of the generosity of his benefactor. Simeon unveiled for them the marvels that God had wrought in him, affirming strongly to them that it had already in that it is already in this life that we must come to the vision of the kingdom of heaven. It was this profound wish to have his brethren share in the grace that he had received that explains the character of personal confidences that his writings bear, something so rare in patristic literature. This untemptable zeal of which Simeon gave evidence brought opposition and ironic remarks from some of the monks who would have preferred a more comfortable religious life and who condemned him as a braggart. They were at odds until the day that about 30 of them rebelled against him and interrupted him violently during one of his catechetical talks, flinging themselves on him like wild beasts and intending to throw him out of the monastery. Remaining motionless and smiling and calm in the face of his enemies, Simeon stopped them in their tracks, and they fled from the church in a great uproar to take their complaints to Patriarch Sisinus. The Patriarch, investigating the matter, completely justified the saint and exiled the rebellious monks, but Simeon's fatherly love did not leave his flock to be lost outside its fold. He asked that the sentence be suspended and went himself in search for each one of the rebels, asking their forgiveness and begging them to return to the monastery. Peace having been restored after these sad events, he resumed the direction of his monastery, which quickly became one of the great spiritual centers of the capital, drawing many devout lay people and also disciples from far and wide. In spite of his pastoral responsibilities, Simeon did not allow himself to be distracted from his ascetic labors and three times a day, at set times, he withdrew to his cell to bathe the ground with tears. Tears had become second nature to him, and they had brought about the flourishing like delicate flowers of charity, compassion towards all, patience and trials, and an attractive and gracious expression on a face illumined by the inner joy of the Spirit. After a further vision of the uncreated light, he had received the gift of theology and when he was not caught up in ecstasy, he spent his nights composing wonderful hymns to divine love, which have remained one of the most precious testimonies to the effects of grace in the soul of a saint. The publication of his writings and teachings allowed many souls to find fervor of the time of the Holy Fathers and began the long preparation for the triumph of hesychasm as the official doctrine as an official doctrine of the church. In 1005, urged by his love of God, Simeon freely laid, his, laid down his charge after the, an abbacy of 25 years and left his disciple Arsenius, whom he had long tested in obedience to succeed him. As for him, he withdrew to an isolated cell to devote himself to holy Hezekiah and to sustain his, by his prayer, as Moses did on the mountain, the striving of his monks. Having become, through, through contemplation, familiar with the sight of the things divine, he was then initiated into the knowledge of future events and the ultimate state of creation. One night he was transported into a light that penetrated all parts of his body and turned him entirely to fire and light, and he heard a voice from on high telling him that this glory that was transfiguring him was the same as has been reserved for the elect at the general resurrection, and thus it was possessed by the Holy Spirit and become a God by grace that he wrote his theological and mystical treatises. But although he had attained perfection, he had yet to be tested by new tribulations. After the death of his spiritual father, Simeon the pious, he had ordered that his icon be painted and had composed a liturgical office in his honor that he had solemnly celebrated each year on the day of the commemoration of this apostolic man with a great gathering of the faithful who came from all sides. This custom had already been being observed for more than 16 years when Stephen, the former metropolitan of Nicomedia, 
who had become the patriarch Sinkelis, a man of great learning and with considerable influence in official circles, took umbrage at the fame acquired by St. Simeon through the city as a man of God and a theologian of the doctrine of the Spirit. Looking for an opportunity to discredit him, he first challenged him with a subtle theological question, but received from the saint a dazzling reply in verse, in which reminded the Sincellus that it is only through experience of the Spirit that one can truly speak of theology. This reply unleashed an implacable hatred on the bishop's part, and he spread odious, cal- odious words about St. Simeon, accusing him of honoring as a saint a man who was a sinner. Finally, through his intrigues, Stephen managed to have the man of God exiled in 1009. Left alone in midwinter on an uninhabited hill near Chrysopolis in Propontis, Simeon gave thanks to God and sent a letter of thanks to the Sincellus for the trials he had found for him. On receiving this letter, Stephen, consumed with fury, had the cell of him who, stripped of all, found even the burden of the flesh hard to bear, ransacked on suspicion of having concealed gold there. His only reply, Simeon sent his benefactor a further letter of thanks, having found a ruined oratory dedicated to St. Maria Marina, he regulated, regularly celebrated the monastic offices there and peaceably gave himself to prayer. But in the meantime, disciples and admirers of the saint among the aristocracy interceded for him to the patriarch, and after f- a further appearance before the synod, during which Simeon would make no concession concerning the veneration of his spiritual father, the pontiff sent him away in peace, saying, You are assuredly a true studite, full of love for your spiritual father, but you have, you also have their obstinacy, and perhaps that is worth a eulogy. On re- his return to St. Marina to devote himself to holy quietude, he received many gifts which allowed him, in spite of the ambushes set by demons, to be transformed, to transform the place into a monastery that drew all the zealous Christians from the capital when he celebrated publicly the feast of St. Simeon the Pious. Under the inspiration of the Spirit, he continued to compose his hymns and wrote treatises, teaching that neither the forgiveness of sins nor sanctification can be granted without the conscious presence in us of the grace of the Holy Spirit. This grace did not only carry him into sublime ecstasies, but also worked many miracles for the upholding of his disciples and the consolation of visitors. Having reached a great age, he was seized by a long and painful internal illness that left him bedridden and incapable of movement. In spite of this infirmity, one of his disciples saw him one day raised from the ground and surrounded by an indescribable light while he was at prayer. At the end of all his battles, he received the deliverance that he desired and joined the choir of the saints on the 12th of March, 1022. Having predicted exactly the date of his death and that of the translation of his relics 30 years later. After having glorified God in himself throughout his own his life, St. Simeon was glorified by him after his death by manifold miracles, but even more by the spiritual delights that his works down to our own day provide for those who thirst for the living God. By the prayers of St. Simeon, the new theologian, may the Lord God have mercy on us and save us. God bless you. We're here for you. We love you dearly. Don't hesitate to reach out. Call us, email us, leave us a message on social media, leave us a note in the comment section. If you'd like to support this ministry, remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on social media. Again, God bless you and have a beautiful rest of your day.